patients who are intubated on mechanical ventilators should be continuously monitored and reassessed for their ventilatory support needs. As the patient's etiology for respiratory failure resolves and the patient's condition improves, they will require less mechanical support for oxygenation and ventilation. Although mechanical ventilation can be life-saving, prolonged intubation and mechanical ventilation can lead to increased infections, weakness, cost, ICU delirium, and complications. Therefore, as the patient improves, their need for intubation and mechanical ventilation should be continuously reassessed for weaning and discontinuation. Weaning protocols are recommended as studies show that their use decreases the length of intubation and mechanical ventilation by 25% and de decreases length of ICU stay and ventilator-associated pneumonias. However, not all institutions or ICUs are the same, necessitating protocols be tailored to the patient population being served. Patients should undergo daily readiness testing to assess readiness for weaning, discontinuation of mechanical ventilation, and the ability to breathe independently. Indicators of successful liberation from mechanical ventilation and extubation, such as the rapid shallow breathing index, should be considered in each patient as appropriate. The process of extubation should be done in such a way to ensure successful extubation and independent patient breathing. Daily readiness assessments include more than breathing and respiratory parameters. Hemodynamic stability and intact neurocognitive functioning are also required for successful extubation, airway protection, and independent breathing. This example of clinical assessment of readiness for a spontaneous breathing trial includes ensuring the cause of the respiratory failure has resolved or improved, oxygenation is adequate, acid base status is in an acceptable range, the patient is hemodynamically stable, and the patient is able to initiate breaths independently. Additional considerations include adequate hemoglobin levels, normothermia, and mental status. Once a patient is deemed ready for a spontaneous breathing trial, the provider must decide how to perform the SBT. SBTs should only be conducted once per day. Conducting them more frequently can lead to further respiratory weakness and has not been shown to improve successful extubation. Although historically, SBTs have been conducted using CPAP, pressure support ventilation, and TPs, the American Thoracic Society and American College of Chest Physicians released an updated guideline in 2017 stating, for acutely hospitalized patients, ventilated more than 24 hours, we suggest that the initial SBT be conducted with inspiratory pressure augmentation between 5 to 8 centimeters of water rather than without. This group of experts also stressed the importance of pairing ventilator weaning protocols with sedation weaning protocols, which has been shown to decrease days on mechanical ventilation and in the ICU. Patients who need continued ventilatory support tend to breathe rapidly and shallow. Patients who no longer need ventilatory support tend to breathe more slowly and deeply. The rapid shallow breathing index is a sensitive and specific predictor of weaning success. RSBI is calculated by dividing the respiratory rate by the tidal volume measured in liters. Using the cutoff of 100 breaths per minute per liter, the RSBI has a 95% negative predictive value. 
of patients failing extubation. If the RSBI is greater than 100%, patients are more likely to fail. Patients with an RSBI calculated below 100 had an 80% likelihood of successful weaning, or a positive predictive value. Providers must ensure that patients can protect their own airways from aspiration by assessing the strength of the patient's cough, their ability to manage secretions, and ensuring their Glasgow coma scale is greater than 8. Some patients are at high risk for post-extubation stridor. Providers must rule out the risk factors for post-extubation stridor, which include prolonged intubation, age greater than 80, a large endotracheal tube, an elevated Apache 2 score, a Glasgow coma scale less than 8, a traumatic intubation, female gender, a history of asthma, or a history of aspiration. Even when patients pass their spontaneous breathing trial, the procedure of extubating patients should set the patients up for success and prevent complications. Pre-extubation procedure includes preparing for re-intubation in the event the patient fails. Patients should be positioned head up. Pre-extubation suctioning of the mouth and endotracheal tube is necessary to clear secretions. Providers should ready post-extubation oxygen delivery devices, such as oxygen masks or nasal cannulas. To extubate, Providers should remove the endotracheal tube securing devices, deflate the pilot balloon, and remove the endotracheal tube. After extubation, the patient should be placed on supplemental oxygen. The oxygen flow should be set to meet the goal SpO2. Providers should auscultate the neck for strider and auscultate the lungs for bilateral air movement. Finally, patients should be observed closely for stability for several minutes after extubation.